and one, Kira Kennedy. Hi, my friend. Hello, Lee. It's so great to have you on. I got to tell you, I've been looking forward to this conversation since I asked you to do it last year, <laughs> very selfishly, just because you are one of like if I had to pick five people to sit in a boat with for 24 hours and have a conversation, you'd be one of the first in there. I feel the same way about you. We have yeah. such a I've been looking forward Sarah. to this. What a great way to uh, begin a new year. Yeah, Happy New Year. This, this one will be over in about 15 seconds. This <laughs> compared to last year, it was like I blinked. And, and it was done. But um, we had some amazing conversations on our walk and talks that we do uh, pretty regularly. And uh, it has been wonderful for me in the sense that you, I went on a, a quest the last couple of years trying to find my people and you are so in that wheelhouse. And I feel that I have fulfilled some of my duty in your life in teaching you how to say the word fuck. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, uh, it's been an interesting <laughs> journey to hear every very seldomly but perfectly timed <laughs> the word fuck will come out of your mouth like once every four or five conversations and I'm like, yes, she's getting me. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm sure your husband and kids are just finding it fabulously interesting to see you evolve into this person who eloquently uses the word fuck right at the right time. <laughs> it does take practice, I think. It, it, yes, as you can see, I'm a seasoned professional. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I wanted to have a conversation with you is because leadership is something that is just so front and centre for me and the content that I want to bring to the podcast this year. And... Um, I really want to, as an industry, look at how we lead and the way that we lead and why we lead the way that we do and invite us to just do it better. And, you know, I've, I've been saying the last year or so that the barrier to entry for our industry is so low and to become an employee and it's only marginally higher for people who want to go into business because all they really need is the money and an idea and they can do it. But the more I think about that, the more that I realise it's not just our industry. Most industries have quite a low barrier to entry when it comes into going into business. And Baratza turns, is it 20 or 25 this year? 20 last year. So we're starting our 21st. Congratulations. That's such an incredible achievement. It's, um, well, like you said, it uh, happened in an instant when, uh, when our marketing cheers department, cheers, when our marketing department said it had been 20 years and we were going to talk about our anniversary, it was like, oh my gosh, where did, where did, did that 20, 20 years go? Come, where to go? And, and how did we get where we are over that 20 years? So, yeah. Did you come up years. with any answers? <laughs> well, I, I'd say a lot of luck and a lot of hard work. I think that that statement where they say um, you get a lot of, you get more luck when you are working hard and doing all you can and all of a sudden you're able to take advantage of the luck. And mm -hmm. I would say that Baratza was working very hard for our first 10 years and creating products and creating a brand and um, caring about making a difference. And when manual brewing started happening, in, I don't know, 2008, 2009, we happened to have a grinder that fit with into the manual brewing craze. And so I'd call that luck. Mm -hmm. And um, and kind of the rest is history. We grew extremely fast after that. And um, it's, been, it's been very fun. You raise an interesting thing that I 
haven't pondered much on. Um, the idea of the relationship between timing and luck. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because like as leaders, we're constantly working on trying to ha get better ourselves. But what role does luck and the relationship between luck and timing play in that, I wonder? Have, has your journey over 20 years given you any insight into that? Do you think? I, you know, I, I don't know that my journey has, but I'm just such a big believer in personally, if you are working on yourself, developing yourself, developing your skills, mm -hmm. improving yourself, that opportunities just keep showing up um, that you're able to take advantage of. Whereas if you're stuck and you think you know it all and you don't need to learn and um, then opportunities show up and you go, oh my gosh, I'm not ready for this. I don't know how to manage. I don't know how to build teams. I don't have the money to invest in this. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's how do you just keep, whether it's within your company, how are you improving your skills, your employee skills, your culture, your products, uh, your brand? Um, and then some opportunity comes along and you, you're there and people think, oh, this would be the perfect product to go with this. Or this would be the person, the perfect person to lead this. Or this would be the perfect person to be on my board or to advise me on this. Or, and so do you call that luck or do you call it you're working you're working to develop yourself, have more fun, develop your company, and people take notice and opportunities start showing up. Had I, you built a business before? I can't no, remember from our I last hadn't, conversation. Actually, I I had worked for people and um, actually Kyle has has been in an entrepreneur in three different businesses. And I started working with Kyle during his last business. And when he left that business, he said, I want to start a business with you. And I don't didn't see myself as all that entrepreneurial, but it was funny that when I quit my job, um, my real job, and- <laughs> This is not a real job. 20 years later, it's not a real job. <laughs> and I love that. My, my boss said to me, oh, I think this is perfect for you. You've really always had that entrepreneurial spirit. So I don't know what an entrepreneurial spirit is. I think I think it has to do with commitment and the commitment to, to get things done, whether you're in an organization or outside of an organization. Mm -hmm. It's really an attitude of taking responsibility, and you can do that and have kind of an entrepreneurial attitude where you're always looking to improve things, create things, take responsibility for things, bring things up. Um, and you can do that no matter where you are. But I took that into Baratza. And uh, now I can't imagine um, not having that attitude spirit no matter what I do in my life. It seems like it's such an innate part of you. It it seems almost crazy to think that you didn't recognize it in yourself. As a friend of yours, I look at you and I think, I've got so much to learn from this woman. <laughs> How could you not know that about you? I'm And you're not somebody who... who likes to focus on you so I, I I won't make you comment on that it's just a, a kind of a a thing that I you know I don't know how you couldn't see that element in you but I'm glad that you did because you know most of us have a go at so many kind of entrepreneurial endeavors before we find one that sticks I'm so glad that the first one that you attempted stuck yeah. yes <laughs> I feel blessed or lucky or um and you know I Kyle and I both look back at Baratza and we really see the 
the incredible journey it's been and how much fun it's been and how many people we've been helped by and how many people we have helped along the way. And it's just been an incredible journey. Uh, it was it was kind of funny. Pierce, who is um, the manager of our support team now, has worked for us for nine years. Uh, mm -hmm. We celebrated his ninth year, which was pretty exciting. And um, we we helped him go to college. So we have wow. um, a program for education, and he ended up um, going to community college and then on to get his business degree at the University of Washington. And he came back, and uh, he was doing his final project, and he was doing it on Baratza, and uh, it was about the challenges we had had, or it was our story or something. And one of the things that was interesting was he first talked to Kyle because he worked a lot closer with Kyle than me. And then he said, would you read this and tell me if there were any other challenges? And it's funny how when you look back over 20 years, all Kyle and I could see were the positives. Yeah, wow. And it was interesting to go, oh, yeah. We had some really awful things happen to us along the way. <laughs> and, um, and yet... Those awful things ended up leading to us being the company we are. Um, and I guess you always say that about people. It's the hardships that they go through that actually build the grit and the personality mm -hmm. and who they are. And I would say it's the same thing with companies is you can look back over those hardships and see that who Bratza is um, – and why we ended up as a grinder company and why we ended up designing our own grinders, all of that was based on problems and challenges that we had along the way. And yet we both look at it as what a journey, how fun has this been? And um, we still have challenges and more journey ahead of us. So I really admire that you take that mindset because I'm somebody who... Um, I look at all the, the hard stuff and I think like this time last year, I don't know if I've shared this ever publicly. I may have told you in our personal conversations, but this time last year, I felt like the most incredible failure that ever existed. And I, wow, that even gets me emotional just thinking about it. Um, I honestly was looking at these two businesses that I was building and thinking like, what a total fuck up I am and and that was because all I could see was the things that were hard and I saw the things that were hard against my better judgment like I knew differently but just kind of I had felt so worn down by challenge after challenge after challenge and betrayal after betrayal after betrayal it wears you down so much when you're trying to do these hard things and I know you and I were talking on the um on a personal call the other day and we were talking about friction <laughs> and you know for me I, I now understand that I unlike the mindset that you take that how fun it's been and how you've grown from it I realized as I was kind of pondering on this thing of friction and where I was this time last year I had just put too much friction in my life. I, uh, the, the, the size of the amount of hard that I was dealing with was just too much for me to be able to kind of bring into a, 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 a size of dealing that felt manageable. And of course, I survived it, and I not only did I survive it, but I was able to capture it, and and work with it so that I could thrive. I think, and I hope, like the the numbers say that I have. But there's something so lovely about a mindset that looks at hard after hard after hard, and sees, man, wasn't that fun? <laughs> well, I'm sure 
I'm sure not all the moments were fun. And I'm sure the people around me go, oh, shit, what is she talking about? <laughs> um, because hard is hard, no matter no matter what, it's not like you get up in the morning and go, oh, I hope today is filled with lots of different challenges. Right. I think we all live our lives as if, oh, I hope everything goes smoothly today. And yet, um, you know, I think what I find fun is, is looking at getting over a challenge or through a yes. challenge. or And what really I find fun now is working with people to get through challenges, is that I know that I have a team. We have a management team at Barazza that is absolutely incredible. And um, and we make decisions as a team. And so it's not like I get up and go, oh yeah, this is the way we're gonna go. It's like, no, we have our international people, our marketing people, our manufacturing people, our support people, and we get together and say, okay, how do we take care of all the things we care about in all those situations? So how do we take care of our importers, um, our factory, our employees, our consumers, our resellers? So a decision can't be made that's just taking care of one part of that. So it's not like our support people get to say, well, this would solve all our support problems, but we wouldn't sell anything. Or, right. oh, this would. So how do we look at it and and to have a team that I can call up and go, guys, we're having a meeting and and this isn't a right or right wrong answer. You know, you we're not looking at black and white because you don't need a team to help you determine between black and white. You need a team to help you determine all the gray areas I love that, that are uh, there's not an easy solution. There's not a right solution. I'm going to be picking between three or four options. And I think one is better for Baratza. It fits better with our mission, our core values. It takes care of our stakeholders. And how do you, my team, help me make that decision? Help me see the things that I'm blind to. And um, so... When I have challenges and I get to do that with a team, and I work with many of them, I mean, it might be with you. It might be me calling going, oh, Lee, I just, I don't understand how to do this. <laughs> and listening to you get through a blind spot with me. And at the end of the day, I go, wow, that was incredible. Yeah, I our, know all our conversations today. are incredible, though. What? All our conversations are incredible. <laughs> I just, I feel so fed um, after every one of our conversations. I feel like I breathe differently after we talk. Just because they're so real and they're so honest and they're so intentional. And a, a big reason this podcast exists is because I want more people to strive to have those conversations. And I'm fortunate enough to have incredible people like you in my life that I can have those conversations with every day. And you do feel so enriched when you walk away from a conversation with somebody like you because there's no agenda, there's no power battling, there's no needing to be right or wrong. It's truly an exploration of each other's minds. And and that well, thank you. And I feel the same me. about you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question about you, your approach to your leadership. As I'm hearing you talk about that grey space that you navigate with them. It's the first time I've heard anybody put it like that that your leadership team is there to help you navigate the gray, not everything else. Have you always over 20 years been like that or did you develop that as a leader? Well, I definitely developed the team as a leader. But, that but I think the reason, yeah, well, Kyle and I, when we started working together, one of the things we really had fun with um, was that his company was going through a lot of issues and 
we would get together and look at a problem that he was having and realize there wasn't a right answer. Um, because right answers are easy to pick. <laughs> I mean, when, if there's a right answer, chances are you're going to go, yep, that's a right answer. Yeah, you're not right. even going to stop and think about it. So where you're stuck is, oh my gosh, there's either nothing but bad answers here. Yeah. Or, oh, I'm trying to decide between three or four okay answers. None of these are clear winners. Clear winners are easy. <laughs> so, but, but I think different shades of gray. Sorry. They are, businesses aren't there. made around a clear answer because yeah. somebody else has already thought about it. They're yeah. made around how do you finesse your way? Um, to develop intentionally a culture, a product, a brand, uh, whatever. And how do you continue to walk down that with um, honesty and care? Um, and the two of us would say we were in the swirl. swirl. And what in the swirl was, was talking about it and sitting with it that, oh, we have these four or five options. We're trying to figure out which one's best. And we would talk and talk and, I mean, over a week, you know, just kind of sit in that mess. And uh -huh. it's uncomfortable at first to sit in the mess because you really just want to make the decision and go, okay, uh, I'm going to go here. And instead, the two of us just loved these conversations mm. that we would have where we would explore the blind spots or we would explore putting down all the different options. And, and then from that, being able to kind of meld something that we thought would work and that we, were, we had talked about it enough that we really understood where we were going, what what were going to be the risks and benefits of taking this and moving on. And we had a blast doing this. So we then decided we were going to start the business. And really, for the first four or five years, it was just the two of us. So we developed, uh, when we, at, we started out by just being an importer of um, coffee equipment. And then we kind of were forced to get into the grinder side of the business and Kyle decided he would go back into product design. Um, and we were answering all the support emails and all the support calls and developing the product and talking to the customers. And there were only the two of us. And um, so we didn't have a team and we har I hardly knew anybody because I hadn't been in the coffee industry. So it was really the two of us slowly beginning to build up um, the people that would help us, the network. Um, slowly we started hiring one person, two people. And it really wasn't until probably three or four years ago that um, I became the CEO I think two years ago, and I said, I want to start having, I want to put together a management team and I want to start having regular meetings. So it's only been in the last two or three years that I would say we really have a team of people that work closely together, uh, talk on, I call it a rhythm of conversations. So uh, instead of calling and saying, okay, we need to make this decision, we have a meeting every week. Some meetings aren't very exciting. Uh, they might feel like a waste of time. But what we're doing is we're building the relationship and the trust with each other that you can come out and actually say something and know that the other people in that room will take you seriously. And, um, and in that, we share some personal stuff at the beginning of the meeting of, um, what's going on in our life. I call it the pow, wow, how. And the pow, pow is wow, what, how. <laughs> the pow is what your challenges are, what's, what's really knocking you down. Your wow is this is what I'm really excited about in my life. And the how is what are you learning? And we start each meeting with that. And from that, we've gotten to know that each of us has pow, wows, hows in our lives 
that we wouldn't know about if we didn't share. And that has really built the bond and the trust between the seven of us. And, uh, and now we've had some very tough discussions where we had to make a decision and people definitely had their sides. You know, I want this and I want this. And you start in and go, it's actually not about being defensive or convincing other people or forcing your way, we really need to figure out a win-win where all of us win. And, um, and it's not a democracy, we're not gonna vote. What we're really gonna do is talk about it and hopefully we will end up coming to some sort of consensus as to which is the right direction to go. And, I'm watching it happen more and more where people don't come in um, defending their idea as the only good idea. Once the team has made the decision, we all buy into it, we all move forward. So it's been really powerful. And so my leadership, I think that's where this all started. I'd say my leadership has been learned through practice. I, um, I, I'm involved in a leadership program called Generative Leadership, and it really is about practicing leadership, that there are basic skills to being a leader, and you can read about them in a lot of different books because mm -hmm. we're all reading about things like, oh, you need to have a team, or oh, you need to have a mission, or oh, you need, you need to have key promises, what, whatever, but how do you build a team? What is a team? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, uh, what does the word team mean? Does your team, do the people on the team actually buy into the mission of the team or the vision of the team? How do you get them to? How do you treat each other? Those are actually skills that you can learn and reading them in a book is really great, but it's actually putting them into practice. And, and I, I, generative leadership is about embodying the skills of being a manager, embodying the skills of being a leader. And you don't embody them by reading a book. You embody them by putting your body in there and doing it and realizing sometimes it, it's really hard. And a lot of people are looking for a type of permission to step into the kind of leader that they want to be. I've got a great example of that that happened this week with, um, I can't remember if I told you about this a couple of days ago, but forgive me if I'm repeating a story that uh, I've told you, but um, I have these clients, they're brilliant. They're so well read and they're such open hearted, intentional leaders. And they've brought me in to help them with the way that they're structuring their leadership. They have a bunch of cafes. They have a distribution company, a roastery and all of that. Um, and I haven't asked them if I can say their name on the podcast yet, so I won't. Um, but it's one of the owners and her general manager. And they are such brilliant women. And uh, every reference thing I've given them to read or listen to, they've usually already across it. <laughs> and so what they're looking at is a transitioning workplace where the age of their employees is um, getting younger and younger in their cafes. And so they're looking at how they lead with the younger generation. Ooh, and and when I asked them to tell me what they thought that the culture of their workplace was like, it was one thing. And then they, I asked them to go and ask their employees what they thought that the culture of their workplace was like. And it was hard for them to hear the responses. Mm. And the underpinning thing that kept coming back was a lack of trust on delivery. It's not that they didn't trust their um, their leadership team to be good people or that they were well-intentioned. It was a lack of trust in deliverability of that intention. And the other thing was a lack of relatableness. And so what you have in that situation is these brilliant Gen X women trying to lead 
a workforce of Gen Zs. And so I um, they had the kickoff meeting this week. And so I said to them, you know, I, I, I love what you're thinking of presenting to this team if you are presenting to a group of IBMers because it's a presentation, it's really well thought out, PowerPoint, blah, 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 it's great, except they're not going to listen to any of it. And I said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, how good are you at rapping? <laughs> That's great. And they, they, they said, uh, what? I'm like, no, really, I'm not even slightly kidding. How good are you at rapping? And, you know, this was what was the brilliant thing about these women. They jumped on the idea. I suggested it on Friday last week. The kickoff meeting was on Tuesday. They sent me a video of the rap that they did that summarized everything that they wanted to deliver in a one hour presentation. They dressed up, they really wore the parts, they got their team to be like their hype people, they got music done, all of it was done like that. Wow. And it was a massive hit. It was all over their social media for their local area. It was fantastic and this was this wonderful intention being coupled with permission of you know that there it goes to that thing of like you could, that you were saying you can read about all of this stuff but until you step across that line of like a f fear that you have of doing it and somebody gives you permission to activate a lot of the stuff that you've worked and tried to actually do it differently and challenge your vulnerable like you, you and I've talked about vulnerability so much this idea of stepping into the power of your vulnerability and being like all right I'm gonna look like an idiot but that's the point here is I'm gonna be vulnerable I'm gonna and do it in a really strong way of like clearly these middle-aged white women are not professional rappers but they do love their team enough to signal them in a way that says, hey, listen, we get that we think we've been listening to you, but it's not in the way that you need us to listen to you. And so this is our way of saying, come, we're going to try and listen the way that you need us to listen. And then we'll work on this together, all of these challenges that we're experiencing as a team. So it, it's just been really wonderful and I hope we can do more of this across the industry of like finding mentors that can mentor business owners into giving them permission to try the things that are different mm -hmm. than they would normally do. Um, you definitely do that for me a lot and you give me so many things to think about when it comes to how I approach my own leadership. Um, I feel like the big sister of the industry um, for a lot of the the kids that are coming up through the industry and a lot of business owners contact me and say, you know, they thank me a lot for what um, happens on this podcast, whether it be through the Daily Coffee, Coffee, Coffee Pro <laughs> or on the Map It Forward podcast, these conversations. Um, but all of that stuff is inspired by the people who feed me with things to think about you know it's none of it is anyone's unique anything it's just the way that you put it through your own processor and what comes out the other end right the quality oh. of the food that you put in is going to determine the quality of the thoughts that come out and that is so um, that is so true it's um i I guess one of my huge values and one of the core values we have at our company is continued learning. And I, um, I love to learn mm. and, um, and I love reading. I love going to classes. I love talking to people and it's definitely one of my, I would say, uh, what I do for fun, which a lot of people would go, you're kidding me. And it's like, no, I really, I really love this stuff. I'm a junkie. And, um, 
And it's really fascinating to see what's happening in our corporate cultures and Mm. the direction we're going and um, how we are going to build companies that um, that are people centered and take care of of employees and take care of consumers and have a personality and uh, it's a real exciting opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for rapping, but um, lady, I will get on a stage and rap with you any fucking day of the week. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> 2020, here we come. <laughs> the SCA is just around the corner. We could, I'm oh. sure. We, <laughs> <laughs> we could oh. find some chains and we could definitely put some wigs on and just <laughs> really have fun with it. But you know, we'll work. On, we'll work on that. <laughs> with regards to building people focused companies this is one I'm really challenged with at the moment when I look at the future decade for our industry because I see automation becoming something that is definitely um, I want to say at the center of what we're doing but it probably won't be it won't be the center of what we're doing for 10 years i think it's more like 20 years but with regards to the role that automation will play with regards to manufacturing and the production of a lot of the products that we do whether it be in the cafe or whether it be in your production facility whether it be in homes has Baratza started thinking about oh, the leadership team started thinking about the role that automation will play in the history or the future history of your company? Um, I wouldn't say that we've we've thought about it in a way of here it comes. We need to we need to um, get involved in this and move forward with it. I think we've thought about it from the point of view of, first of all, how do we all accept it? Right. How do we accept? And accept doesn't mean I agree with it, I want it. What accept means is this is the way our world goes. And if I, a cafe owner, I, a manufacturer, I, uh, whatever, don't do it, then my business will maybe become irrelevant or I as a human being will become irrelevant. Right. So it's not really a decision of, oh, is Bratza going to go away from being a people-centered business or am I going to go buy a whole bunch of robots so I don't have anybody answering my phones or building my grinders? Or, or is it, oh, this is the way the world is going and how do we as employers, human beings, realize that we have to begin building the skills that make us valuable um, that a robot can't have? What are some of those that you think that you'll be able to salvage? Well, I think they all have to do with um, communication, Mm -hmm. connecting, caring, intuition, wisdom, leadership, coordination. Yeah, wow. What are the valuable things that, that, Technology is not going to be able to make people feel cared about and connected with. Um, You might feel that you get an email from a company every week and that means they care about you. But does it really mean that? Um, Your customer service program. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. Your customer service program has been a big inspiration for me. Your focus 
on people from that perspective is so genuine and real that it has definitely influenced the way that I think about customer service. And I think the reason that I want to know what your take is on this automation thing is because I think that it is as important to Barata's business as the quality of the grinders that you build. Do you do you see it that way as a leader? Oh, definitely. We see, we actually have this, This I'm looking at it. We have a little uh, VIN chart actually of, I call it the three, the three um, legs to our stool. And I think I might've mentioned it before. <laughs> and it's marketing, product, and operations and operations for us really is support mm -hmm. and getting grinders out the door. Um, and support on our management team is an extremely important part of our sales and branding. And I, um, you know, when we talk about what we care about and what we care about is taking care, making, well, our vision statement is uh, making sure, I always have to look it up, um, to strive to create a company for anyone who comes in contact with us feels cared for. Yeah, I can see that through your social media. And that doesn't mean we care about you. It means you feel like we cared about you. Tell me we, more about that because <laughs> if somebody wasn't intentional enough at exploring that, they might think that what you were saying was we're pretending to care. You know, I just have these great stories about uh, our support system that actually almost bring tears to my eyes because they really are about how do we care. And, I mean... We had, several years ago, we had a woman whose husband was in the hospital, uh, I think, with cancer. Oh, um, and um, and she called and said, my grinder isn't working, uh, and told them the whole story of what was going on in her life. Mm. And somebody said, great, we'll, we'll ship you a grinder. Don't worry about getting the one you have back to us until You're you have been the bandwidth. We just need to get you some coffee. And it's those kinds of stories. And I'm not saying we do it right all the time and that everybody who talks to Bratz and feels cared for it. That isn't, that isn't what I'm saying. What it is is that you are able to connect with another human being and feel compassion or empathy for the situation they're in and that you go, oh my gosh, this is pretty bad. I'd really like to, I'd like to make your life this much easier. Does having a cup of coffee in the morning make your life perfect? No, but it might be the one thing that at the end right. of the day, you say, I'm really grateful for the cup of coffee I had this morning, right? <laughs> I've um, told you that in, in conversations we've had before. Sometimes when I go on my gratitude walks, <laughs> The most I can be grateful for is the cup of tea that I had or the cup of elixir, the glass of elixir that I had. You know, sometimes everything's falling over, but you've got that thing that shows up every day the way it needs to show up. And sometimes it's the only point of gratitude that you've got. And, it's and when it doesn't show up, it's heartbreaking. It's and the straw that breaks the camel Coffee is that for a lot of people. Really and is. so is a coffee, I mean, we also say uh, coffee grinders aren't pacemakers. And so, you know, if something <laughs> like happens, it. it's not like you're going to die. But we also know that for some people, it feels like you're going to die. And um, so how do you... How do you take it seriously and yet not take it so seriously? Like, oh, no, we didn't just ruin this person's life because um, they dropped their grinder on the ground and it's not working anymore. Or 
um, they they overground coffee and now it's clogged and they can't figure out how to unclog it. Or, you know, we also have grinders that break. We understand that the micro switch didn't work or whatever. Um, stuff happens. And, but we, we want to fix our grinders, but we want to fix you too. We want to make you feel like we heard you. We understood your frustration. We know what it's like not to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, you're not too excited about putting your coffee in a sock and, and mashing it with a hammer. Oh, and so, so we're going to have to figure out something else. So how, how do you reach people where they are and um and and we started this conversation about technology and robots and automation and all of that one of the things that we are really trying to deal with is how do we show people we care about them the more automation you put in the way of talking to people there's people who love automation. They don't want to talk to a human being and they really would rather um, something just answered, you know, when is my grinder going to arrive or when is this happening? Right. And other people want to text you. Some people want to Instagram you. Some people want to email you and some people want to talk to you. So how do you design a system um, that can, can touch people how they want to be touched and the more automation, this is my fear, not necessarily, um, uh, this is an old person's fear of, I don't want so much technology in the way that we nobody can get a hold of us. So I hate it when I call the bank and, and you can't, it takes a lot of work to even figure out how you would talk to a human being. Yeah, or UPS you have to go or anything like that. Right, the chain yeah. of, you know, is this what you want? Is this what you want? And you're waiting for them to say, or do you want to talk to a human being? And that's not there. So then you go, oh, no, which one do I pick that might lead me to a human being? Mm -hmm. And some people would go, yay, I love that. I hate talking to human beings. And other people are saying, I'm not going to feel comfortable doing this banking or fixing this grinder unless I have a human being on the phone. So how, and that would be the question of, can we make our customer support automated a hundred percent and take care of everybody? I don't think so. Right. So how do you, and, and can, a robot build something perfectly? Can a robot make decisions as to, they can probably make decisions between white and black, but can they make those great decisions right. that are, are we going to do this? Are we going to do this? So if you as a person or you as a company are not offering value that requires a human being, that requires connection, communication, coordination, intuition, problem solving, um, intentionality, whatever those words would be, chances are it's going to be automated out of our culture. And some people would say, well, that's that's great because those are redundant things that are done over and over and over and might not require a human being. Some people would say, oh, you're losing the art. You're losing that connection. Well, then how do you as a person that is that art and connection, how do you be more of that? Not less of that. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's a very hard thing for us to think about. But as a human being and as a corporation, I think we have to realize um, we're not going to turn the, the clock back. There are going to be robots. There are going to be technologies that get that answer questions and support people. Oh, they're already and, here, right? Right. They have so then what is what is the value of you? Right. I I think that we're extraordinary or extraordinarily fortunate 
to be facing what I think is going to be one of the most determining decades in the history of humanity. This next, if not this decade, certainly the next two decades are going to be so pivotal to determining what happens to the human race. And, um, you know, th including things like our effect on the climate, uh, our effect on the way that humanity is going to interact with each other and with whatever comes after. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at things like AI and you listen to the, the very smart people who are developing AI talk about it and there are some real concerns that they some of them have um, and it's really fun to listen to both sides of that debate like no matter how smart you think AI is going to get it will never be able to take over because it doesn't know how to do things like rationalize with empathy you know so so it's it's going to be very interesting to watch how it all unfolds and who knows if the planet is going to have humans on it in 30 years from now. The planet's going to be fine. Whether it keeps us on it or not is going to be very interesting. Do you think about this stuff as a leader and in the way that you look at the future of your company? Like this is the first 20 years of Baratza. Let's hope there's another 20 years of Baratza at least. Do you think about the succession of leadership and do you think about where Baratza and its intention will be taken over the next decade and the next two decades and what it will look like? Oh, that's a big question, Lee. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Kyle and I have been talking about what's going to happen to Baratza for many years. Um, I tell the story. I mean, we're both getting old. We're both getting to that point Older. where Easy you with the get old to business say, <laughs> how long will we have the energy, the interest, the, the mental ability, the whatever to continue to, to be involved with Baratza? Uh -huh. And what happens when we don't want to do that anymore? And so... Um, there's that whole thing of succession and what happens next and um, what's best for for Bratz and for the employees and for all of our stakeholders. So we are definitely in that conversation. And I have to say for me, it's been kind of funny because when I started Bratz, I actually, I thought it would, it would be, an okay company. It wasn't like I didn't think I would make any money or whatever, but I never thought it would be grow to be the company right. it is today. I love and that. so <laughs> I walked around thinking, and then all of a sudden it kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. And, and um, she, she scratches her head while he's just saying that, like in confusion. <laughs> what? I love it. And I mean, I now laugh because I, I have my niece works in in the tech industry where everybody gets their millions of dollars of investments so they can make their company a grand, huge yeah, success nice? in, in three years or five years or whatever. And uh, I actually had somebody about three months ago explain, you know, oh, yeah, I'm 28 years old and I'm looking for, you know, $100 million so that I can. And he said, you know, when you get an investment, it just allows you to speed up how how fast your company grows, which you have to do or somebody else is going to take your idea. And I went, oh, yeah, that that does make sense because it took us 10 years just to kind of decide what we wanted to do and begin yeah. to make a market for what we wanted to do. Because when we started selling grinders, a uh, $129 grinder was super expensive. 
Um, grinders were either people bought their coffee ground, right. they used a really blurred grinder, or they used um, a grinder that was 50 bucks. And, um, and so really, when you start, when we started thinking about it recently, it was like, oh, yeah, we kind of created this home market grinder that was above a hundred dollars and below. I mean, our, our forte is $900, but it's like commercial. So I would say to $600, there just wasn't anything like that out there. Mm -hmm. And so it took us and the manual brew craze and all of that to build this market where people still think $129 is a lot of money for a grinder. Um, but a lot of people would say, I get it. In order to have a great grinder, it's probably going to cost you at least $100. Yeah. Well, it's an important... And now balance. most of our competitors have come in and there's more on the way and there is now a market for grinders that are above $100. And you can look around and see a lot of grinders at the $200 to $300 range. Um, and all of them have different ideas and different challenges and stuff. But I'm kind of going off off board but it took us 10 years and you think of what happens in technology where how long did it take a facebook or a twitter or a whatever they don't have a whole lot of time to get traction and grow and move and so they use investment capital mm -hmm. so i i kind of laugh about yeah we are definitely a bootstrap company we um we started with uh, Kyle and I um, doing all the work. Uh, we never got investments. And where does the company go now? I'm not sure. I would really love, I think for me at this point, I, I really love to be a role model of a company that is people-centered and profitable. So a company that is intentionally working to take care of, of what we care about, which is the people we deal with. And the number one would be our employees because our employees are the ones that touch everybody else. Mm. So if our employees aren't taken care of, why would they take care of the consumer? Why would they take care of our resellers? Why would they service our products? Um, with care and love to make sure when you got it, it, it worked. Um, so taking care of our employees is, is one of the biggies. Um, taking care of uh, the climate is really important to us. We made decisions a long time ago that we didn't want our grinders to end up in the landfill. And a lot of people say to us, that's ridiculous, because if your grinder is thrown away, then people will buy another one. And it was like, no, we really, we don't believe that something should be made obsolete because it broke. And so when you go to our website, we have lots of parts that you can buy. We have lots of instructions of how to fix the grinder yourself. We intentionally have our parts pretty inexpensive so that people can buy them without feeling like they should just buy a grinder instead. Um, we have PDFs, we have videos, we have human beings that will walk you through how to fix your grinder. And if you aren't one of those people, and I'm probably not one of those people, <laughs> we then have a repair program where you can send the grinder in for pretty inexpensively and we will fix it and send it back to you. And we'll do it in, I think it's three days now. So if we get it, you send it to us, we fix it and ship it back to you. Um, and it leaves a, our office in three to five days. It could be five days now. Um, this so is how do we end... And all the grinders we get back on warranty, we, we refurb and sell. 
um, grinders that we demo or use, we refurb and sell. Uh, so we're really trying. And, and our Encore, it's actually not a money-making process because um, it takes time, somebody's time and money to fix a grinder in order to, um, to continue to use it. And those grinders sell for $139. And so it's, it's kind of like, no, for us, even if we're not making money, this is the right thing to do. Because we don't want to create more plastics, more metals, more, more a hardship for our climate. And it's our, our work on sustainability. And we've now started a sustainable uh, team where we're working on other ways to reduce our packaging. But people expect packaging to be really beautiful. They expect their grinder to look great when it comes out of the box, not scuffed. And so how right. do you design packaging that doesn't have plastics in it, that uses reusable cardboards, that does that and yet comes to you looking cool, um, without too much plastic and cardboard. And it's, I don't know that we're winning the war, um, but we're thinking about how do we, and again, does this take care? We think it does. We think it takes care of everybody if we begin to be a role model of saying, wait a second, we think there is a way, uh, and there's many ways to be sustainable. Um, and each company needs to think about that for themselves. Mm -hmm. But for us, this is part of who our company is, is we want to keep our grinders working as long as we can possibly keep our grinders working so they don't end up being thrown away. And we have a lot of maestros that are still, still people are still fi fixing them and they were our first grinder back in uh, 2002. So, we still support the grinders that we have built along the way and we want to keep them going. Isn't it fascinating <laughs> that a, a very old school kind of approach, which is fixable appliances, is now considered innovative? <laughs> yes, that's scary, isn't it? You know, but it's true. It's, it's I, I saw this... Uh, I can't. I don't remember what show it was, but this guy was introducing himself to his date, and he he was telling her that he uh, was on that new show, Pope, the new Pope. You should check it out. It's fantastic. You'll probably find it utterly inappropriate in all the right ways, but it's very interesting. Um, but he was introducing himself as something that's now useless. He's a um, an appliance repairman, and he's virtually unemployable and I thought how hilarious is that that that's now something that you can't you really virtually can't find a job in it if that's what you do and yet it's one of the main things that could help us stop having shit going into landfill and that's something that when I talk about customer service and the kind of approach that Barata takes that's the kind of thoughtful progressive thinking that I think can only come from a company that's led by people who have been leading for some time with intention? Well, I, you know, when we started it so long ago and it was so much a part, and I'm going to say so much a part of Kyle, that he's a fix-it guy. I yeah. mean, he's, he, he fixes everything. And, um, oh, he does. He's, um, he's not a guy that throws stuff away. And it was so much a part of who he was that it became a part of who we are. And what's interesting, when I started looking at, I, in my class that I was taking, I was learning about strategies. And I didn't understand, I don't think I understood or embodied, as we were saying, what a strategy was until I was really thinking about what are the strategies that makes Baratza who we are. Uh -huh. 
And once you start writing down what those strategies are, and one of them being fix it, don't dump it, is one of our huge strategies, our whole business is designed around it. So a strategy isn't something that we could change tomorrow and go, oh, yeah, it would change everything. It would change our website. It would change. It's the backbone of your company, right? Like it's the skeleton. Yeah, it it is the skeleton. And, you know, there's so many little skeletons that we're looking at now to go, are these, are these still good skeletons for us to have? And, um, and I, whenever I go, well, if we changed any one of these, we would have to completely change how we go to market. Yeah. what we care about. Um, they are so built into the culture of care that we are. And right now we're looking at some of them to say, wow, the world has progressed a long way since we came up with this. Is this still the right way? Does it take good care of our employees, consumers, resellers, or is there a better way of looking at this? And I think strategies are kind of, you can have them as a person. This is who I am. And at some point you still have to look at it and go, this is who I am, but will that still work for me today? Yeah, wow. And how do we we take our companies and take ourselves and change and grow and yet, Stick, hold our integrity and our authenticity and yet have the courage and bravery to look at some of those things so um you know as you're saying that it's interesting because not only is the, if the skeleton is the fix it and that's a rep- that's representative of kyle mm-hmm. the muscular system of barata would be what you bring which is and what you embody which is empathy and intention I think that's the word that I'm looking for like if if you look at the brand, branding of Baratza they're the things it's very much you and Kyle it, like hearing what you've been saying about the kind of man that Kyle is and the kind of intentions that you have and and what is important to you it's I would say that Baratza is is a successful emulation of the two founders of the company. What an achievement. Well, you know, they say that if you, when we just worked on our vision and core values of just this year um, and hired somebody to help us talk about it. It was a very fun project for both Kyle and I to, to come up with this. But what all the stories say is the co-founders are the culture. It's and true. If you begin and and the the hard part is sometimes the co-founders haven't thought of it, everything that might be important to them. So so they begin a company that might be extremely product driven or extremely competitive. And they might not be thinking of how that is going to affect their branding or their, or whether they're a great company to work for Mm -hmm. and they'll be able to attract the kind of skills they need. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I think what's really interesting, we used to think, you know, I don't think Kyle and I thought about culture for the first 15 years of the company, we just did what we did. And then when I said I wanted to write it down and figure out what's our why, the Simon Sinek, what's our why, how, all of that, um, I think we we hired it so happened to be my niece who, who works in Silicon Valley and in um, human resources and and people development and culture. And so she did it as a favor to me. And it was really incredible to realize, to, to 
to bring it down to who are Kyle and I and how did that build Baratza? And then we took it to our employees and we said, okay, this is how we see our vision and our mission and our core values. And we'd like to know if this is how you see them. And it kind of goes back to what you started with is do the people that work for you actually feel that the culture is the same mm. as you think it is? And they came back and, um, and I always say, please tell me when we're, we say this and we do something different. Right. And um, we now have a, a group of people that work for us that will tell us, we don't think you're walking the walk. How we don't think. fucking great is that? That's trust. So it is trust. And I hope they would agree with me. I mean, sometimes you aren't as connected as you think you are and people don't tell right. you. But I can tell you, I just got an email the other day from somebody um, asking about something she really cared about. And it was, oh, man, does this punch my buttons a little bit. And, and but it, it comes down to care. Mm. And care is such a big subject that there's always more that you could care about. And this was another thing that we as a company could be much more inclusive in our language and um, in our approach to everything. And that's care. And how do we bring that into our company? And so are we walking the walk? Well, yeah, we think we're walking the walk, but there's always those blind spots where your employees, your your consumers, whoever can come up to you and say, I don't like all the plastic you use, or I don't like the words you use, or I don't think you're this. And it's like, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. So walking your walk is, there's always more to do, right? And that's the fun of it. I could talk to you for another three hours. Oh, is it that time? <laughs> it's oh, my gosh. <laughs> what did I tell you? Like, it just goes so quick, doesn't it? People are always, without fail, people say to me, what are we going to talk about for two hours? And I'm like, I promise the time's going to go so quickly. But you've got another meeting to get to. And, um, lady, I can't tell you how much you – inspire the shit out of me thank you for being in my life and my friend and thank you for doing this it really means the world to me well thank you for inviting me and this was fun this was a great really conversation fun. it was just like a walk and talk wasn't it <laughs> it was just like one of our walks and talks have an amazing rest of your day Kira thank you so much thank you, See bye, you bye. Later. bye bye